a spoon-shaped bill, a bald head, and soft pink feathers. It's a sight you just can't miss. There are six different species of spoonbills in the world, with the rosiest spoonbill being the only one found in the Americas. The other five are found in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. To find this bird, head to the coast of the southeastern United States, Mexico, Central America, or South America. They are wading birds, foraging in the shallows of fresh, brackish, and salt waters. Oftentimes, they can be found with egrets, ibises, and herons close by. They are very social, preferring to forage, nest, and roost in groups. And what do you call a group of roseate spoonbills? Now that is known as a bowl of spoonbills. They are in the family Threskiornithidae, which contains wading birds such as ibises and spoonbills. Nicknames for the roseate include flamebird, pinky, or pink curlew. Males and females look the same, except that males are slightly larger. Young roseate spoonbills are born with straight, narrow bills. At around day 9, they begin to flatten out. At day 16, it starts to resemble the characteristic spoon shape, and by day 39, it is just about at full spoon size. They are sometimes mistaken for flamingos, but when placed side by side, you can clearly see the difference between their bills, neck length, and overall height. Their preferred diet is small fish, shrimp and other crustaceans, and aquatic insects. Upon closer inspection, one might wonder how it is able to see these critters in dark water, or how is it able to see prey if it is kicking up mud and sand as it walks? This is where their unique bills come into play. They aren't looking for food by sight, but by touch. They hold their bills slightly agape, moving them from side to side in wide, sweeping arcs. Once prey touches the bill, it snaps shut, and with a quick backward flick of the head, it throws the food back and swallows it. The wide, flat bill provides a lot of surface area and is full of nerve endings to sense the prey while it forages. Of all the spoonbills in the world, the roseate is the only one with pink coloring. They get this from pigments known as carotenoids that are found in the food they eat. Here's how it works. Algae produce red, orange, and yellow pigments. Small fish, crustaceans, and invertebrates consume algae. The spoonbills consume these aquatic critters, which then produces their pink-hued feathers. So, are they born with pink feathers? Chicks are born with pink skin and white down, and they develop pale pink feathers while in the nest. There's a lot of variety in appearance among these birds. Young birds, such as this juvenile, have fully feathered heads, while older birds have varying degrees of baldness. Just like many humans, they lose the feathers on their heads as they mature. Interestingly, the rosea is the only spoonbill that experiences total balding and coloring of their heads. Some of the others in their genus undergo partial balding and a tiny bit of coloring, but not nearly to the extent as the rosea they undergo their first complete molt at around 14 to 15 months old. This is when the forehead, crown, cheek, and throat become bare. A line of black skin extends from the ear opening and around the neck, marking where the feathers stop. The unfeathered skin may have hues of green or blue. The dusty pink bill of their adolescence turns to a dull green, blue, or grayish color. Their feathers become a darker shade of pink, and they may or may not have the beginning traces of the deep pink on the wings, also known as the carmine wing coverts. The second complete molt takes place around 20 to 21 months of age. At this stage, there may be further feather loss from the head, and even extending to the neck. The skin may become more green or a golden yellow. The area of black skin may widen or extend further down. The surface of the bill becomes rough with black modeling. The carmine on the wings becomes a more saturated, vibrant pink. They also get carmine streaks on the front of their neck. 
These particular feathers don't lie flat, but curl upwards. And lastly, they develop a patch of buff yellow by the top of the wing and also on the tail. With the different stages of plumage and variety from one bird to the next, there is no shortage of fascinating bird watching available with these birds. Roseate populations were decimated in the late 1800s and early 1900s in the United States. Like their eager and heron relatives, they were victims of the plume trade. Not only were they collected outright, but their nesting colonies were greatly disturbed, plummeting their numbers down to near extinction. Since the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed in 1918, their numbers have made a comeback. However, they are still affected by changes to wetland habitat, which they rely upon to find food and successfully reproduce. If you are lucky enough to live near these beautiful birds, I'd love to hear about your experience seeing them forage, roost, fly, or preen in real life. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Thank you for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.